Last time on Hakai, it was discovered that even in death, Dr. Jiro was still full of secrets. Our heroes found one of his old hidden labs containing androids 13, 14, and 15, all of which are vastly more powerful than 16, 17, and 18. However, this could actually turn out to be a good thing as Bulma believes they can be reprogrammed for good. They just need the help of a little nepotism brain superhero lover. Unexpected Allies and a scene reminiscent of the superhero movie. Hmm? Bulma arrives in style, pulling up in a sleek, glossy black limo that exudes sophistication. As the vehicle comes to a stop, Dr. Hedo observes her arrival with cautious curiosity. She beckons to him, her tone friendly but with an underlying urgency. Do you think we could have a little chat? Seemingly apprehensive at first, he can't help but be intrigued. He hesitates for only a moment before getting in. It's likely he's already somewhat familiar with Bulma and her family. Specifically, the revolutionary work her and her father are responsible for at Capsule Corp. Their inventions have shaped the world in few ways others could match. Though she avoids diving into every minute detail at this point, Bulma outlines the situation, emphasizing the gravity of the predicament they find themselves in. As the limo rolls down the road, what she explains mostly makes sense to the young man. He thinks he gets what's going on, it's kind of strange, isn't it? He remarks his tone thoughtful. For you, of all people, to be asking me, Dr. Drow's grandson, for help. After everything that happened, you were his enemies. Unfazed, Bulma calmly explains. Dr. Drow was a very bad man, and what he was doing had to be stopped. Her voice softens as she reflects. At the time... I always thought it was such a waste. Someone as brilliant as him, using his intelligence for such destructive purposes. But I don't think you have to go down that same path. You could do the good he never did. There's a pause before she gently asks, Do you hold any resentment towards me for being part of the team that brought down your grandfather? Hedo drops his expression for a moment, weighing his thoughts before he responds. He doesn't care what happened to the old man. I was just a kid back then. I didn't even know him. He remarks in a suddenly casual tone, shrugging off any attachment to his grandfather. This revelation comes to a bit of relief to the Capsule Corp heir, who visibly relaxes in her seat. It had been a delicate question, but this response removes any lingering tension. However, Hedo isn't done. He leans forward slightly, his expression now turning serious. But I'm not doing this out of the goodness of my heart. I expect to be paid, and paid very well. He also insists on having the freedom to research and carry out his own projects without interference or objections. I need full control over my work, Hedo states firmly. For the daughter of the richest man on earth, this is no problem. With a confident smile, Bulma responds. I'll pay you two billion zenny per android you create or help us improve. It's a generous offer, but one that barely scratches the surface of her vast wealth. And you'll have access to everything, every resource imaginable. Materials, equipment, tech, anything Capsule Corp can offer. A contract like that is a dream come true to the young prodigy. The offer is more than fair and Hedo's eyes gleam with excitement. A wide grin spreads across his face. Perfect. Bulma, also thrilled with the agreement. Great, pack your things. We're getting started right away. The limo begins its ascent, approaching a mansion perched atop a secluded hill. As they near the entrance, Hedo narrows his eyes suspiciously. How did you know this is where I live? He asks, glancing sideways at her. Bulma laughs sheepishly. Let's just say I did my homework on you. Hedo arches an eyebrow, but isn't particularly bothered by the invasion of privacy. And why did you move to such an isolated place anyway? Bulma's curiosity piqued by the mansion's remote location. While well, Hedo assures it doesn't matter now, anyone familiar with the official manga would know that it was to work on his... more controversial experiments. Namely, his... zombie slaves. After quickly packing his things, the two of them head out to the secret laboratory, an even more remote location hidden from prying eyes. It will now serve as their base of operations moving forward. As they arrive, the equipment hums to life. 
and Hedo wastes no time diving into his work. His fingers flying across the keyboard as he analyzes the data. Bulma, standing alongside of him, watches intently. She can't help but ask, So what do you think of all this? Without turning away from the monitor, Hedo stares fiercely at the screen. From what I've seen. With my great intelligence and Capsule Corp's technology, I can certainly take up my grandfather's projects and improve them a lot. Proving Bulma is right to place her confidence in him. He'd like to start now if she doesn't mind. Fine by her, but first there's someone else he has to meet. Grandma stepping onto the scene, we shift our focus over to the Universe 7 Planet of Destruction. Here we find both Oob and Majin Buu. They were brought to this isolated world for safekeeping. Majin Buu is one of the great primordial beasts, and together, Oob and Buu form a small but essential piece of a much larger puzzle. Meanwhile, in the background, Beerus is far from pleased, fuming with frustration. He yells at Boo. You ate all the food on my entire planet! His sharp, godly tone seething with exasperation at his wit's end with this pink creature. But the carefree Majin doesn't seem to be paying much attention and is unbothered by his anger. He merely continues to bellow. I'm hungry! As if that's the only thing on his mind. Of course, Beerus is having none of it. He glares daggers into Boo. Get your own food! Leaving the reader to remember. Can't Boo make anything out of anything? Can't he just say, make candy out of the dirty stands on? Beerus's patience is wearing thin. Pycon said he was coming to get these two and keep them elsewhere, but he's taking too long. I can't stand this pain in the butt anymore. Deciding he's had enough, Beerus finally calls out to Majin Boo. Hey, you! He shouts, grabbing the pig monster's attention. I need you to do me a favor. If you do it, I'll give you all the food you want. Getting his attention. A few minutes later, we'll have to wait to find out what this favor was. Icon arrives in the Hexahedron. He brings with him a couple of guests. Getting a look around, the pair get a good view of Beerus' planet for the first time. Piccolo points out how it seems like a calm and silent place. Quite fitting for himself, actually. The god corrects. It was very calm and quiet before I met all of you. Pycon apologizes for the delay. He had to convince Sun Gohan to come with him. In fact, he wouldn't have succeeded in doing so if not for Piccolo. The half Saiyan laments this is going to result in him being jobless for the first time in his life. An attitude his longtime friend has to correct yet again. There are higher stakes at hand than his 9 to 5. The fate of the Earth and the universe is far more important! Also, your father-in-law is rich, so your family won't go hungry! Gazing side to side, the Celestial Guardian questions if Master Whis is around. He was hoping for the opportunity to see him this time. But no, he's not here. He went somewhere with Vegeta. Further, Beerus doesn't know what they want to do or how long it'll take him to get back. Icon closes his eyes in thought. I see. In that case, I'll take these two at once, along with Gohan and Piccolo. As the five of them board the cube, they leave us to wonder just what kind of intense training regimen Picon has in store for them. The Guardian leader had previously commented on the immense potential he saw in Gohan and Piccolo, recognizing their strength and latent abilities. But now with Majin Buu and Oob on board as well, the question lingers. Could Picon see that same potential in these two? 
So with the planet empty, Beerus took the opportunity to take a nap. However, this rest would be short-lived as more people arrived on his planet without him noticing. Seeing a surge of energy radiate over the tree line, he wonders whose power this is. Beast and Vegeta have returned to Beerus' planet, this time with Broly in tow. It doesn't take long for Vegeta to ask Broly to power up in order to sense his energy. He realizes that the Saiyan Brood has gotten even stronger since their first battle on Earth. He quickly decides to move to the next step. He wants Broly to transform. But before they can even begin, Beerus stomps over. Spotting Whis, he groans and addresses his attendant. Whis, what's going on now? After that yawn, Beerus' gaze shifts to Broly, his eyes widening in recognition. And what is this lunatic doing on my planet? He remembers all too well the chaotic energy Broly unleashed during their last encounter. Whis pauses for a moment, choosing his next words carefully as Broly awkwardly looks around unsure of what to say. Social interactions aren't exactly a strong suit. But after a brief, hesitant glance towards Vegeta, he finally manages to point in his direction. The prince steps in to explain. Since Kakaros isn't around anymore, I've decided Broly is the most suitable sparring partner for me. He's a Saiyan, just like us. With immense power and untapped potential, training with him will push me to surpass my limits. That's all well and good, but does it have to be here? Go train somewhere else! Beerus growls in response. This isn't some kind of hotel you can bring people in and out of without asking! But just as he's about to continue his rant, Beerus catches a familiar scent wafting through the air. His nose twitches and he turns to find Lemo, who's apparently been cooking up a meal while they've been talking. His expression softens for a moment as he samples the food. The taste is enough to distract the destroyer from his earlier frustration. And after spotting Sheila nearby, his annoyance begins to dissipate entirely. Perhaps having Broly and his crew here isn't the worst thing. Sheila's presence seems to have helped shift Beerus' attitude, and he begrudgingly accepts their stay on his planet. Whis, with a pleased smile, claps his hands together to signal the start of the training session. Shall we begin? Beforehand, however, Vegeta sets a grim tone for the battle. Broly. This won't be just any ordinary training session. I want you to fight with the intention of killing me. <laughs> Meanwhile, on the Universe 12 planet of destruction, Lord Jin, the god of destruction of Universe 12, hovers in deep meditation over a serene body of water. His angel, Maritino, observes his god's contemplative state from a distance, quietly thinking to himself, now that Lord Jin has completed all of his work and has nothing left to destroy across the universe. He has devoted every ounce of his focus to meditation, seeking mastery over his power of destruction. But Jin's focus is abruptly shattered when a new presence arrives. He opens his eyes and his calm demeanor cracks. What do you want? Why are you here? The figure standing before him is none other than Goku, flanked by Vados. Wearing the mantle of his new role, he declares, God of Destruction Jin, I need to talk to you. Venturing all the way to Universe 12, what could this possibly have to do with Goku's intentions of going back in time? Could Jin somehow hold the key to that? And if our hero is able to finally do so, what exactly are his intentions? Really?